Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, thank you for coming to CBA tonight. Thanks for joining us. How many have seen the exhibition already? Okay, good, great. Well, welcome and welcome to all you newcomers. We hope you spend some time the exhibition. I'm Melanie Finlayson. I'm the gallery manager here at CVA, um, and I was also given the great privilege to curate this exhibition called Pressing for Change. Pressing for Change celebrates various ways that printmakers provide an accessible voice for change. Through a variety of approaches, the artists in this exhibition investigate the state of the vulnerable world and these printmakers inspire action while exploring relationships to community, land, and the environment. And I do want to take a moment to thank Cecily Cullen, our talented director and curator, who listened and trusted me and guided me through this curation process. And um, to the, our whole CVA team and staff, the students, I couldn't have done it without you. So thank you very much. And Jenna and Katie, so thank you all for your support. And special thank you to the 10 amazing artists in this exhibit. I'm lucky to have Susan Gotham Campbell with us tonight. I do need to start off with a few other little housekeeping things. Um, MSU is an off campus art center for the Center for Visual Art. And in, for, <laughs> we're the Center for Visual Art, and we act as a resource for students in the broader community through contemporary exhibitions of local significance and global reach. Um, we have an immersive education program and a workforce development program for students interested in creative fields. And I also want to start out by giving our land acknowledgement, acknowledgement, recognizing the indigenous communities that originally inhabited this space. <clears throat> the Center for Visual Art acknowledges the privilege we have to gather in this place. Once the territories and homelands of so many indigenous peoples, including the Arapaho and Cheyenne nations. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land and value the knowledge systems they have developed in relationship to their lands. We understand that offering a land acknowledgement neither absolves settler colonial privilege nor diminishes colonial structures of violence at either the individual or institutional level. Land acknowledgements must be accompanied with ongoing commitments to displaced indigenous and immigrant communities. In order to learn more about the spatial relations, relationships of indigenous communities to lands, we recommend visiting native-land.ca and exploring the interactive map. <laughs> CBA is connected to MSU Denver and supported by the university, but our exhibitions and additional programming are through fundraising. And one of the ways we do that is through memberships. So for all these students out there, if you're an MSU student, you get a free membership to MSU Denver, but you have to activate that. So we have students up front who are happy to help you do that. Please do. And for all of our other guests that are not students, um, there are many different levels you can participate as a member. And these funds help us offer these free access to these programs and evenings like this. And we have a few other awesome programs happening through this exhibit that I just want to touch on. I swear I'll be done talking in just a moment. Um, the additional programs include, uh, this show is up through the 23rd of March, and then February 21st, we have an artist panel discussion with John Hitchcock, whose work is behind me here, Karen Kalink, and uh, Raymond um, Munez, and then on February 29th, um, the collaborators Diane Fine and Amaro Laplau will also be giving an artist talk. And on March 20th, we have a culture club, which is CBA's art making happy hour, and all those events you can register on our website, so please do. Um, CBA also has a paid internship, so you might see those folks, they're happening in the classroom right now, you might see them wander through. That runs through the academic year. This is a teen paid internship where teens learn about creative fields. And they're studying fashion this year, and they'll have a fashion show on March 15th. Um, cool. That was all that housekeeping stuff. Now I get to do the best part, which is uh, I have the honor of introducing a friend and mentor, Susan Gothel Campbell, who is a multidisciplinary artist based out of metropolitan Detroit. Her work considers the engineered environment as a natural process, the integration and erasure of human agency over broader global systems is a concept central to citizens practice. Her work is realized in several formats in this exhibit, including prints, drawings, and installations. 
Susan has been exhibited internationally in Belgium, Germany, and the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Slovenia, and throughout the United States. Museums that include um, Susan's work in their collections in the National Museum of Women in the Arts, New York Public Library, Yale University, Art Gallery, <laughs> Minneapolis Institute of the Arts, Detroit Institute of the Arts, Grand Rapids Art Museum, Jordan Schnitzer Family Foundation, Toledo Museum of Art, and University of Michigan Special Collections Library. <laughs> Susan has taught studio art at both the graduate and undergraduate levels, including faculty on both Cranbrook Academy of Art and College of Creative Studies. And she's been a visiting artist at numerous institutions of higher education throughout the country. And I'd like to welcome her to MSU Denver. And please help me welcome Susan Goffa Campbell to CDA tonight. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you for coming out on this beautiful day. I have to say, I came from Detroit where there was snow, it was cold, I haven't seen the sun for weeks, and I've been walking around for two days, and I remembered to burn sunglasses, so it was a delight to put them on and walk around your great city. Um, I wanna thank Melanie for curating this fabulous exhibition and I know some of the artists in the exhibitions. I don't I don't know all of them, and I've just been blown away by the quality of work here and the concepts behind the work. It opens up a different dialogue um, because of bringing all this work together. Um, also, the staff um, at Center for Visual Arts and Cecily Cullen, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, thank you so much. It's a real honor to be um, presenting my work amongst all these other fabulous artists. So as Melanie said, I'm from Detroit, and this on here on the screen is a milkweed galaxy from far away. Um, I work with a lot of ephemeral materials, and that is a bunch of milkweed flying around. Um, there are several currents that flow through my work, and I found over the years I have keep coming back to the same questions, but I find different ways to answer them. And uh, my my practice is based on inquiries, is what I call them, or curiosities. And I, I had a great meeting with several students today in a painting class, and I encourage everybody, whether you're a practicing artist, a writer, uh, interested in the land around you, to remain curious, always um, keep that well honed because it will serve you to keep um, things moving in the universe. So some of my inquiries are, how do we understand time? What role does science play in our daily lives? Is there another way to think about the built environment? What does adaptation look like? And how do I stay engaged with my local landscape? There's a wonderful book out called um, Curious Minds. Is anybody familiar with that book by Perry Zum and Danny Bassett? Um, it's a wonderful read, and it talks about the science of the brain and the science of curiosity. Um, and what I found so compelling about their research is that it, they're really boiling it down to a need to connect and have this inner connection with networks. And I read the book and I'm going, oh my gosh, finally, there's something that just really resonates. Um, and it's going through science, but it's working with something that is really a thing you need in all of us. I'm trained as a printmaker. And although I have lots of different mediums that I work in, I often return to printmaking. It comes naturally to me. I had a father who I didn't have much of a relationship with. He was a salesman. He was a paper salesman. And my parents divorced when I was young, but I did, I did get to spend some time with him. He was on the road a lot. And after all these years, I realized I just absorbed how he talked about ink on paper. He sold paper to commercial printers. And he'd come home at night and talk about problems that he would have of the coating on the paper was too slippery um, or there was some, some adhesion problem. And I found, you know, as a kid, 
I, I didn't think much of that, but I would listen to him talk about paper and ink. And I also was able to be the recipient of lots of cool paper samples. And he would bring home these sample books. Some of the papers had um, butterflies embedded in them. Just as a, as a seven year old, I was just mesmerized by all this paper. And I went to um, a liberal arts college. I majored in art. At the time I went to school, you were either a painter or you were a sculpture, sculptor, nothing else. And I never felt like I fit in that mold. Um, the world is so much more open now to other disciplines. And for myself, I feel that printmaking is actually a major interconnection between all different fields. It can be painting, it can be sculpture, it can be digital, it can decimate in information out into the world. So it really was a great landing place for me. I make traditional prints and I also do experimental prints. Okay. So this is in the parking lot of my studio. And I am known for a lot of experimentation. I'm in a building with five other artists. One's a photographer, one's a fabricator, two collectors, and they'll see me out in the parking lot. And they'll go, oh my God, what's Susan doing again now? And of course, after Christmas, some people throw out their trees and I stored them behind the, the building. And I thought, when it's a little nice, I'm going to ink them up. I want to see what they look like. So here are some giant Christmas tree prints. So because this is a printmaking exhibition, I thought I would enter talking about my questions, my curiosities through the world of print and how I have used an expanded concept of a print. Uh, so I've kind of broke it down into four categories, traditional prints, print as documentation, public projects, and print as object and multiple. This is uh, a rack in my studio. I, over the years, I have really pared down my practice to just printing off of wood. I don't even, you might call them woodcuts, I don't even carve the wood. The wood is so beautiful that I try to find a gesture in the wood, a grain that needs to be enhanced, and then what I do is ink that wood up and I print color fields or black and white. Here's black and white. This is a, a piece of birch plywood that I've used over the years because it has this beautiful, what I think of as almost a cirrus cloud. And I reuse my wood time after time. And if I show you back, I have little notes on the sides of my boards and I might, so I can remember what it was like. It's like I might have Look, pull up one of those boards for two years and I have one that says looks like the green flash and instantly I know what the grain of that wood is like. So this is a um, woodblock print that is inspired obviously by aerial views of cities at night and instead of as I said carving the wood those white areas are from tiny perforations in the paper so I work in a reductive manner where I remove the paper with a small tool that's actually used in book binding. It's a little Japanese screw punch and it's used to pre-drill paper so you can sew it. I find it's a beautiful drawing tool. So one thing I do is use tools in, for different purposes. Um, another aerial and this is um, from flying out of New York up the coastline when I, I traveled to Europe often and there was one evening where the weather was bad and we had to fly up along the shore for a long time. We couldn't, we couldn't go um, far and I loved the views out the window. So this is taken from there. Over the years, my work has vacillated between landscape as picture and landscape as process to keep reiterating something I see or trying to replicate it has not been as interesting to me. It hasn't fueled me as much. However, I always draw and I will be inspired by what I'm looking at and will make traditional drawings. But I keep asking, 
what more can I get out of this? How can I make it new? Why should I keep looking at this? And I have gone into the world of weather to look at atmospheric phenomena. I've worked with meteorologists, climatologists, scientists, just purely to learn about their field. What I became so interested in was the weather data. And I've attended many air balloon launches, um, looked at ozone, and this lower left-hand corner is um, actually a graph showing plume animation from a weather station in Texas where they would measure blowing dust or fires. And all this information that we're able to pull up off the internet or search, we were, I feel bombarded by it. But I also have used it as fuel for my prints. These are really early prints called Winds Aloft, and they're based on a cross section of the wind at, at higher um, levels in the atmosphere. Pilots will need to look at where what the wind is doing at certain levels. So I learned to read these charts. I also found them quite gestural and beautiful. So I don't, I'm not interested in you going, oh, well, wow, there's a big gust right there. However, these little F shapes, the more bars they have, it means the stronger the wind. So I, I do go in and out of science, real science, but I take a lot of liberty with using the images. So what I do is I try to find a gesture in the data. And so these early prints, they're very mechanical. You see the holes are um, perfectly round. I started to want wanted to move away from that. And I then started to work with pictorial images of landscape, but I inserted the gesture of the data into the landscape in the sky. And because in a way to me, this world of data and information to me is like an atmosphere of phenomena. So I wanted to present the data. You don't really know what it is. It could be a firefly, it could be lightning. Um, I really like it to be ambiguous. Um, and these are these are maybe 12 years old. I, I, I worked primarily just in black and white when I was developing this series. Um, I've worked in various institutions. Sometimes I'm, I'm a visiting artist and I work with um, printmaking students. I had a residency at the University of North Texas and I worked with graduate students. They wanted me to produce the print. Um, in addition of Gosh, 24 of my prints are in addition of four or five. I don't like to make quite a lot of um, prints. Also, they're very difficult to addition, meaning making more than one that looks the same. So you can see how I work with ink and roll my ink out in a gradation. To get those, those black transitions, it doesn't happen in one pass. I might have to layer transitions of black and um, tinted out like four or five times to get that. Then I had to figure out how to have these eight fabulous students that were waiting for me every morning punch holes in my paper. And I do it like a drawing. I, I, I it's, it's very, the decisions are made right then and there, like you make a drawing and here are, I'm, I had to figure out a way to tell them where to punch the holes. So I made these templates and you can see the little tool there where they're um, punching the paper and that, that worked pretty well. They were a little puzzled at first, but they got into it. Um, these are fairly recent prints. I moved into color right before COVID. I had a trip to um, the Bahamas. I went to this ashram over the holidays with my daughter. It was a very beautiful kind of bohemian place on the beach. This shows how I sandblast my wood. This is how I roll out my ink. And this is how I transfer the ink onto a sheet of paper. And I use pretty much all Japanese handmade paper. 
So the series Lost Cities, um, this first iteration is a set of 10 prints. And I just recently had a, a box made for the set. Um, there's additions of five of these are smaller. There's two in this show, they're larger and they're more recent. Um, I also like to work with objects. And while I was working with these prints, I kept thinking about how much news there is about climate and destruction and war and um, eroding uh, shorelines with um, rising sea levels. And I thought, well, what's, what, is, what is heavy and light? Because water is light and beautiful, but destruction is a, a heavy thing. So I made this flip flop out of um, a cinder block. And there's an artist in the show, Adriana. Yes. And she's, she's also used a cinder block. So it's interesting. We both are in that same um, thought process of a metaphor for destruction built environment. Here's some of these prints. As you saw in that video, these are double layered prints. So I'm punching holes and then I print another layer underneath and attach them at the top. So I, it's a way to get multiple color. Um, some of these are not any place. They're not a specific city. They are uh, more of a compilation. I photograph a lot when I travel. Sometimes I use a template, but then I treat it as a drawing. So there might be like, I fly in and out of New York and I know the um, geography of that. And I fly in and out of Detroit and it's very grid oriented. So when I find I'm in a new, new place, like, if you're somewhere in Europe or you're in India, the cities are laid out differently. I find that quite interesting. Um, this is a more recent print of cities. Um, I have a, a person I work with in Switzerland. His name is Tom Less, and um, I just recently had an exhibition there. He trained, he changes over his print shop four times a year and hosts exhibitions. Um, so I was just talking about water. I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, the opposite fire. And this is uh, me working on a series of prints in Germany. Um, I hadn't planned to work in color, but I did because I my black ink never showed up. So uh, it was a really hot summer, and I found at that time the environment was so oppressive. I couldn't do anything but but um, Think about heat, and and throughout my past 20 years, I've really been interested in this phenomena of urban heat islands. Do you all know what those are? Um, it's where, I mean, if you don't, there, like, there can be different weather patterns in cities because of how much pavement and buildings absorb heat. So you can have a totally different weather pattern in a city instead of the outlying areas, and I find that phenomenon just fascinating and. Um, so much that we can work with there with building materials and things like that to change it. Uh, so this is a, a series that I did in Germany called Heatscapes. Again, I was saying I go back and forth between representation and abstraction, working with data and information. This is a show I had in Detroit. Um, and this is more based on we, we see that all the time in the summer, especially where they use colors to let you know how hot it is. And that deep purple lavender, oh, that's that's not so good. Um, and so I, I make these prints that I mount on panels and I like to work with uh, architecture. So this wrapped the space of that gallery so they can be shown in different configurations. This is a piece called Sway. I was commissioned to do a piece for a new cancer center in Detroit, and um, I really wanted to think about levels, levels like water, low being cool, and then the higher up you go, it gets warmer. Um, it's a beautiful facility. My husband died of cancer 10 years ago, and I was just blown away by how thoughtful this new building was in treating cancer patients and how much they were creating a more humane environment um, that is sensitive to people and inspiring. So they they had a big art budget and I was thrilled to have this piece in their collections right out, 
right outside of radiology. These, a couple of these are in the exhibition. Um, they're called Aerial Fire Sky. And you, did Colorado have fault from the Canadian wildfires? You've had plenty of fires here. And you all know what the sky looks like when that happens. Um, so last summer, those Canadian wildfires just, I could not not deal with it. I could not not look. And so I made a series, a uh, new series of prints. And again, these are double layered prints. Can't remember which two are in this show, but they're there. Um, I'm inspired by so many artists. And over the years, there have been people that have influenced my work. Um, a couple of them, Agnes Dennis, her monumental works based on the environment. Um, and Mel Chin especially. And I find there's other work being done. Mary Manley is doing some interesting work with food, floating in our barges in the Detroit River, and Ellie Irons is working quite a bit with um, dyes and pigments. Uh, in 2009, a long time ago, I received a really generous fellowship from the Kresge Foundation. I can't tell you how much it probably all know, but when you have some support for your work, it just allows you to open it up. You don't have to worry about paying your rent or how you're going to buy these supplies. Just to have some funding to realize some of your projects is a true gift. And in 2009, I had this great fellowship and I pushed my practice. Um, I, Because I'm interested in weather, I decided to um, set up a weather station in this Albert Kahn building in downtown Detroit. I had a friend that had a graphic design business on the 22nd floor, and it had a little parapet, you see those little dots down there, where you could walk out and see the city almost from 180 degrees. I crawl out a window and I go sit out there and I do little studies. These are little pan monitors I made. Um, and I just do goofy things. Uh, so the other thing I, I started to do was um, to set up a webcam. I bought a webcam that took still images. It didn't take um, time lapse. It didn't take video. I was so interested in what was happening that is southwest Detroit where the Ford Rouge plant there's a lot of industry there um, as you know it's a big car automotive um, town but there's also a lot of air pollution there and I wanted to start to record the sky so unfortunately this won't play I'm gonna let's see Um, yeah, computers, that's fine. Yeah, we, we're just having such a good time with this one. Okay, here. All right, so this, Melody's going to walk around with this, this video. So what I, what I did for this project is my camera took a picture of this Detroit skyline every minute, 24 hours a day for a year. So I took all of those still images and worked with somebody with that could help me. And uh, they're compressed into a movie at 20 frames per second. I would change the location of the, the um, camera. The entire video, so I did a, a video that is called Detroit Weather 365 Days. This was in 2010. And to show the video, it's it can be long and boring. The data runs at the top, so you see the time, the date. Um, I cut, when I show it, I um, split it in two. The unfortunate Detroit Institute of Arts owns this piece. And when they show it, it's on two screens. And I split the seasons at the solstice. So you can watch, it's just kind of mesmerizing to watch this weather. But what was also so fascinating to me was there were things that happened. I, I love to just do straight observation, record things. Things show up that you, you don't, if you, you didn't know you were looking for them, but you find interesting stuff there. So I um, 
I showed this footage to some meteorologists I was looking working with and they said, oh my gosh, that's that's a fumulus cloud. I've never seen one of those in action. And what happens is the heat and torque from industrial emissions hold cumulus clouds overhead. And they hadn't seen that in the Detroit area. They knew about it, but there it was in my footage. So it, it's that just that little snippet of that, those moments spurred this whole other project for me. Um, the, and I'm moving now into kind of public projects. Um, I talked about this today. This is a cloud spotting Detroit guide I did. And I'm so interested in having people pay attention to their environment, just the Monday. So I used the format of the tourist brochure. I put these around in hotels and places where you might pick up something for a zoo or a, where to go golfing or where to take your kids. And it basically documents man-made clouds and naturally occurring clouds in the city of Detroit. There's a map in there. I have led cloud spotting bike tours of man-made clouds in Detroit. Um, I have a real key that talks about the meteorological um, signage and how you signify cumulus, cirrus, all those clouds. But then I invented my own man-made clouds. I broke it down into categories like Detroit has a number of steam tunnels. And so there's a whole category in this brochure about great steam spots. It's clean. It's, um, I asked two friends to pose for me in the middle of a busy intersection in the middle of February. Um, and I just call it street spots. So we've got one, uh, Daniel Sperry, the graphic designer, and this is a friend who had just run a marathon. Car horns are honking, you know, he's standing in the middle of this intersection, but so the steam. And I have a, a category called savory clouds, and that's where there's good barbecue and good street food. And then these are pungent clouds, that's industry. I, do, I try not to um, criticize, I just try to tell it like it is. Yeah, they're pungent. Um, and this project also, because of all the industrial um, pollution I was witnessing, I started being curious, like how do you measure, how do you measure air pollution? How do we know what's it going into the atmosphere? So I called up the state of Michigan. I get a lot of phones being hung up on me. No, we can't let you do that. But I found one person that said, okay, well, we have an air monitoring technician. I'll let you meet up with him. So I shadowed this guy for three or four months. I read, went around to all the sites where he measures um, particulate matter in the atmosphere. And the upper left-hand corner, it looks like a bunch of bird stations, right? So those are little air, there's a little compressors in there. And you put a piece of paper in these compressors and it pull, pulls particulate matter out of the atmosphere. This filter in the lower right hand corner was um, a piece of its glass spun fibers in these, the papers composed of that, was in um, the compressor for 24 hours in Southwest Detroit. And that gray is what you're seeing that is pulled out of the atmosphere, kind of a pulmon. Um, there's been a lot of pulmonary studies done in that area. So I didn't go just, okay, that's interesting. I decided to do another public project. I've done three of these called Dirty Pictures, Portraits of Air. And the biggest one I did, I was invited to do a project in Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh being an industrial city also has had air quality issues. Um, it's getting way better. So they set me up at this art fair um, over the weekend and I made packages with air um, filters framed blank white piece of the paper. And I asked the participants, I gave them all a packet. I had 100, 100 filters, I got 100 participants. And I asked them to put the filter in a place where they thought the air was dirty. This is not scientific, it's only awareness and it's only as a way to engage people with their local environment. So I took out a website, I posted over the year where they put their filters, and then I had a show of their air filters. 
And um, there's a recording, there's a poem of this. The poem is all the locations where they put their filter. So um, one I love is a really brown one that's from a barbecue place near the meat smoker. Um, and so the poem went near the meat smoker over the hood of the car. And the poem is called Air Moves, but it's just based on where people put their, um, their filters. So as I mentioned, I'm interested in ephemeral material. And I do a lot of really, um, I do a lot of tending material that is that changes over time. Um, this piece on the right is a block of dandelion fluff that's additioned. It's a brick. It's called Seasonal Flyers Spring. Um, this piece that I'm drawing is called Always Red, and I love to document change. So that grass now is totally a beautiful golden brown in that piece, and it changes over time. I don't have documentation. Um, another area that I, this is out of order, um, that I have worked with is grass. I've grown grass and post-consumer plastics, and the carpet that's up in the front is an um, example of growing grass and how um, the roots of the grass act as a print. They record the contours of the plastic container. Here is an example of how I grow these. And wheatgrass is fantastic. It grows really fast. It has a very strong root structure. The roots grow laterally, and I, I build with these things. I make carpets. And when I'm done, I, um, I compost the work. These um, were grass pieces grown in rotisserie chicken trays. They're quite a, they have quite beautiful bottoms. Um, the, these are some stacks these are from sushi big party sushi trays this is um earth bomb farm and lettuce trays so much of our food comes in these plastic containers here are some other carpets i made in the cities where i've shown them one is flint um with all the water bottles and one up here is the denver carpet and then uh chicago carpet so the show that I had at um, North Texas, the University of North Texas, they invited me to do um, an installation. And then they said, would you like us to send the work back? And I said, no, we have a garden. I'd love to compost it there. So I worked with, I came back, I came back to the university and I worked with fiber students. They have a natural dye garden and so we made new garden beds with my installation pieces. Those were in the gallery. And we then, here's some of the, they, they were working with indigo. Um, there were some really great plants, but the soil was really pretty tough, it's dry. And the uh, loaminess of the soil that I used was really good for remediation. So um, that was a great project. There's the garden. There it is, eroding and decaying. Um, the last bit of work that I want to talk about relates to that Dandelion Brook book, a brick uh, called Seasonals. And when I say that, when I had that curiosity, I, I always want to know how do I stay engaged with what's going on around me, even if it's just a season, watching seasonal change. So I'm always picking up debris. I don't have a black walnut tree, but um, a photographer in my studio does, and he's always bringing me bags of black walnuts. So I decided to start um, making dyes with them. It's a very rich color. Maybe some of you have worked with them. Um, again, I might start with just experimenting with mark making. And here I am just asking people to throw walnuts, um, really ripe ones, see if they mark. Here I'm, I boiled it and like, you can hear my dog crying. He's so confused, like what doing there? <laughs> Um, anyways, so um, I use a lot of um, natural dyes that I've made. Actually, not a lot. I should uh, restate that. Walnut is, is quite intense and colored like fast. I don't have to use a mordant. 
So I want something that is really rich and walnut is one I use quite a bit. I also use a lot of eucalyptus with iron. Um, this is a show I had um, at the David Klein Gallery in Detroit, and I think both of these, no, maybe just the one in the piece on the right is in this exhibition. Um, this one is here as well. So um, again, I use that little tool to open it up and perforate the paper so light can pass through and I can get shadows on the wall. And then I really enjoyed embroidery and hand sewing these paint papers together. Uh, the last project I want to show you is something that I'm working on right now for an exhibition at the University of Michigan called Garden Repairs. And this is a very large piece. Um, it is stained with eucalyptus, walnut, and iron oxide, as well as dyes. It has a lot of hand sewing in it and embroidery. There's no um, preparations or anything on here. But uh, it's just become so important for me to be tied into these cycles of life and see that things need to decay, to decline, to refurbish soil. So I've been focusing on gardens. Um, this is a piece in a show that will open tomorrow night, actually in Detroit, it's called Night Garden. And I had a fabulous residency in the fall at McDowell in New Hampshire. I had a, a studio in the woods all to myself. And um, you have the option of staying in your studio. This my place looked like an old abbey or an old Catholic castle. And it was, uh, then I had this porch I could do these dyes on. But it, so I was there September, October, and at night all these moths would come out and then there were spiders. It would just, it was kind of creepy at first and I befriended them. I just, they stayed away from me. Um, so I call this night garden and inspired by uh, that, that moment in time. Um, again, this is garden repair. I've been growing sunflowers, loving watching how uh, the pollen falls and the seeds fall. Again, these are these are one of a kind of works. They're large, um, and they're two layered pieces. But the, the color underneath is a wood block print. Here's a, a detail of it, and these are made with that tool as well as an exacto. This is the last piece, um, which has a lot going on in it. It's seen hand sewing, walnut stains, there's pieces, fragments of woodblock prints, and um, hand sewing. Happy to answer any questions or comments or well, are working in a similar way. Manner, if you're interested to hear about your process. Yes, I should about your paper. I noticed that you sewed together quite a few, some of the galleries here and, and just showed them. Uh, but in your walnut board, that was a single yeah. piece of paper. Yeah. Um, what drives your decision with your paper choice? Great, great question. Um, two things. Um, it depends on maybe where I'm going to show the work. If I have the opportunity to do large scale work, um, which the gallery, the David Klein Gallery is a huge space, then I might decide to use a whole roll of paper. Um, and if I want something to be re really detailed, I may choose to, to assemble it. I, I love architecture. And I almost think of sewing those pieces of paper as the way to make um, something architectural. Um, I, I usually have quite a bit of paper around and I experiment quite a, a lot. Um, but I've also now, I work digitally too. And it, in that there was a overall scene of a big scroll with the two other paper pieces and I, uh, I did a whole series of pieces I have been showed up here called hibiscus years. And I tend to like bond with a plant for many, many years. And I have this hibiscus plant that just is so prolific. It, it is, stays outside and it dies back. And then 
And oh, midsummer, it gets these blossoms that just scream at you, and they live for one day. And it just is a marvel every time I see this plant. So I wanted to work really long in a long format so you can see all this change with hibiscus flowers. I've saved them for five years and I layered them on top of one another in a light box and then photographed them. And that's, I wanted it to be long, like something falling. So I, I I didn't want a scene and I didn't want an interruption to that continuum. So that was the things in your work completely engaging. Oh, okay. how you change the color. I don't know if you can use some of the models with the white and they would dye. So if I if I sew the paper. Do you use the paper afterwards or prior? I I dye the paper first and then I try to find passages in the paper. That are interesting to me, um, and then I'll put them together. Early on, the pieces, these pieces, and the show here, though they're largely mirror images. If you know, they're, they're panels that undulate, and I like this idea of almost a mirror image, but still organic. Um, and I'm getting away from that now, but that's how I started. Um, and. So once I assemble them, then I start to look at what's happening. It's like making a watercolor to go, oh, well, maybe I could open this up a little more. And I, as I said, I work in a reductive fashion and I've always done that. I've always drawn by blocking things out or erasing. And I do that physically with, with paper. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of curiosity about the cold water power plants. Yes, such a great question. And so ironic. Um, I was just in Ian's class today and I wanted to show something to, to her students because they're talking about place. Um, that I wasn't going to talk about tonight. And one of the series that I showed was this, this series based on an incinerator in Detroit. And I've also had a fascination with power plants over the years. Um, and it got so, I understand the pain of wanting to, you know, get into something. Uh, I've always been kicked off property. You know, the police have, like, they'll call their security and ask me to leave. Um, Coal. I mean, if it, if you want to get into the the plant, or do you want to do something about the plant? I don't know what to keep closing the door. I don't feel like Oh yes. I just want to observe like one of the boulder and probably like one of the big buildings. Yeah. As far as just the volume, really old building that's maybe about twenty feet close or twenty feet to see it from far away. Yeah. Well, I can give you a couple of ideas. <laughs> One, <laughs> if you could get a webcam or something that you could zoom in or you could partner with somebody. So the project I did in Pittsburgh, um, they, I think they, they had a thousand dollars for me to do something there. They wanted me to project a, uh, maybe, maybe my weather video on the side of a building. And I said, you know that? Okay, but you know, I'm really interested in what's going on in your city because it's so parallel to Detroit with air pollution. And I said, I have this project I'm doing with weather and um, particulate matter. Um, I know you have some great organizations in your city, and one was the Breathe Foundation. So, I mean, as artists, I was never trained. You have to do your research. You do research, and which I love to do. So I made a I said, look, could I talk with somebody about maybe partnering? And they said, sure, we can do that. And then they said, well, we work with the Heinz Endowment. That's the, you know, the catch-up bowl. They have a lot of money um, for um, environmental projects. So I went to Pittsburgh, I had a meeting with a program officer and I brought documentation of projects that I had done in Detroit 
And I showed him footage of my webcam from Detroit. And I want you to know there is a, um, a site called Air Now that um, I used to follow him and looked in. These are places where there are webcams set up all over the country that sometimes are in national parks, sometimes they're in urban areas, but it's purely to look at air quality. Um, and I offered the state of Michigan to use my webcam to look at what was happening in the atmosphere around Detroit. Oh, no, 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 we can't, we can't, we can't do that. You know, that's off limits. So going back to Pittsburgh, the program office said, said oh my gosh, you know, there is this Coke plant down the valley that I can see from my office and they're not supposed to be running it at certain hours, but I know they do. So they have the money, they buy three webcams <laughs> and they start documenting what's going on um, with some of those plants. So just a suggestion, if, whether it's for your own work, you, you just persevere, right? You just have to um, find ways to, um, if it's to bring about awareness, um, you don't want to, I don't want to set people off at all. It's not my intention at all. Um, but I want, I want to work with people and, um, to bring about awareness. So the power plant, I don't know what else is around there. Is there Sure. Yeah. Um, and is it, um, is it, it's been probably in, uh, used for years and years. Yeah. And are there efforts to try to shut it down for all sources of power? Yeah. Yeah. Well, keep at it. That's all I can say. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's such a good question because it is. As you can tell, my practice is crazy diverse, right? And um, the the process of narrowing it down is largely my intuition. Um, I might work with something for a year, and it, it just it, it doesn't it's not fueling me, or it's too didactic, and it's not offering anything back to the person. Um, I, I'm not, I've made didactic work and I find creativity is energizing, but preaching and lecturing is not. And so I find if I can be stimulated and engage with a project and it keeps me asking questions. So, do you know the artist Ann Hamilton? Okay. So she was in Detroit last year um, doing a talk and I love her work. And she said something that really resonated with me. She said, you know, my biggest fear is that I don't have the right question. And that is so important to me. And so the research is research, but then I have to find the right question. And I don't want to answer the question. I just want to work to propose a question. Because I, I'm, I just, that's, that's the inquiry, right? Um, but I also have to be careful not to get so far out there that I lose the center um, of that kernel of what, what was the original impetus was for the work, because I can just go off and left field. And believe me, I, I do that at this late age of mine. It's like, Suzanne, bring it back. Okay, what was your original intention? And I, I stay open and flexible, but um, I then also ask myself, what is the best material to talk about this? And that is why I'm constantly investigating materials. 
fact, I was talking to somebody in your class and about, um, you know, if you're stuck, just keep doing. It doesn't have to be, just keep moving. And just, things come um, when you're, maybe you're not looking for them. And I find that to be really helpful. Like if I, if I don't know where to go, I, I might just go out and experiment with, um, during COVID, it was a really rough time for me and I wanted to be out in nature and it was hard to do that and I live alone and I was, I thank God I'm in a building with a lot of other artists. Um, I went out and I harvested a red twig dogwood one spring and my goal was to get in my car, find a dirt road and get lost, just get lost. And I would go out with my clippers and it was just so delightful to forget about this pandemic. And I spent, one whole winter learning to steam bed wood, red ocean dogwood, and I wrapped my whole studio um, with red so it would record the rectangular shape of it. I never did anything with that, nothing. You know, I stayed one stick and I spent months doing this, but it'll lead some, it'll come back to me somewhere. Is that a two question? Any others? One last question. Yeah, way in the back. Is there any question that comes to mind if you were any kind of mentor? Oh, any anything in Denver that in particular? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, I've got, um, you know, the terrain is so different for me. I, it's flat where I am. And uh, I did have a reaction to. Uh, Empty buildings, um, land not being uh, cared for, I guess, like a lot of cement. And this is such a beautiful landscape. And I saw people, a lot of people with their ski bags, and I'm, not, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is, do you realize how gorgeous it is? You have sun here and everything. So I think it's, my question is, this is a beautiful place, but you know how how is it being cared for? The, the the urban area and the surrounding areas. That's that's all. And I've only been there for my second. <laughs> and I haven't been to Denver for a long time. So. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm an architect. Uh huh. I'm a designer, and so I thought it was very interesting the way that you kind of present work. Because to me, I feel like super architecture coded, or maybe yeah. architecture tries to get as close to your style anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, I try to get close to yours. Right. Like, no. <laughs> and I think it's such a, like, it was super exciting to see. And, uh, but I think one of the things, have you, have you ever actually like worked with architects in the, in your design process? And what do you think about the prospect of um, vegetation that's created by construction? or the construction of new architecture or the construction of new architecture because of the change of the, the ecosystem. Yeah, that. Right. So that uh, I would love to talk to you after this. Um, and so, yes, I have worked with. Uh, if I were to go back to school, I'd love to be an architect or environmental science or I mean, there's so many fields that are interesting to me. And I'm currently working with an architect right at this very moment for um, a hanging structure that I'm doing at the University of Michigan. Um, so, and I'm finding while I'm here, I'm getting emails about the specs and what's difficult for me is I can't see the material, I can't feel it, it's just a diagram. Um, but aside from that, I find that there's not enough conversation between some of those fields. I did a project quite a number of years ago on a book called Zone. And it was based on looking at the architecture of leaves, different leaf patterns, you know, the branching, some are opposite, some are really organic looking. And I, I went and worked, I asked um, a couple of landscape architects if they, if I gave them a big blow up of a leaf and I said, would you please zone this for housing industry, um, single dwelling homes, and I gave them a choice of four leaves. One was a katsura leaf, I think. One was um, like a maple leaf, 
Anyways, all different branch patterns. And there was one, I can't even remember the link, but I could pull it up, but and the, they were opposite. And they looked at the sleeve and they said, oh my God, an engineer would do that. I don't want to do that. Because because it was just so, and they, they had these attitudes about, you know, each other's fields. And I thought, oh my gosh, we need to talk to each other. Um, they had this, this idea. But in terms of the building, I'm very interested in that because we're, we're, we've created this symbiotic relation to this environment. We, we can't go back in time. We have to find a way to um, work with structures that facilitate um, growth and life that is healthy for us, healthy for individuals, but also mindful of um, plants and animals, you know, that they're, they're not second class citizens. We're, they're, we're all in this together. And um, do you know the, the building in, it's a rainforest, it's, it's in, um, let's say Hong Kong or somewhere. Anyways, it's a totally enclosed space and it, it has all these ecosystems, but they're completely contained inside the building. Do you know what, which project I'm talking about? Yeah, Biodome. I was just reading about this in a book on the Anthropocene. And what's so interesting to me about it is, um, gosh, I don't know where it is. Um, it, it's a tourist destination because you have all these beautiful plants from all over the world that are maintained in this controlled facility. And they are stewards of the plants, yes. But then you also look at the labor force that is maintaining these, and it's also in the wrong part of the world, some of these. So I wrestle with the dichotomy of creating some of the problems and um, having a totally closed system. I don't know what to do about that. I mean, uh, the coral, there's a the coral reefs in Florida that are dead. They are now pulling them out of the ocean and they're going to maintain them separate from the ocean. So, do you have any ideas? <laughs> it, it is, yeah, it's naturally occurring. The ocean has its own practice of doing something with it, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, these systems, and I'm going to go back to that book about curiosity. One thing that they talk about is how. We really, I myself, want for this interconnectedness with people in other fields and um, just with the environment and compartmentalize things to the point where that's what I look for in my work. And that's why I enjoy meeting people and going into diverse practices. Thank you. Okay, one more, yeah. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Oh my goodness. I get on my bike and I have jars, plastic jars, and I take one band line at a time and I twist it until it bangs inside the plastic container and all the fluff comes off. And it takes me a long time, but it's quite lovely and I always feel weird out there doing it, but I don't care. I, I got to get over it. You know? um, so then there's no glue, there's nothing, there's no spray, there's no fixative. Um, I have a container that I've made that's the size of a brick and it has a top on it and I shake it and it just kind of compresses. And all of this is my fascination with ephemeral material. So dandelion wants to stick together when you do that. I've also worked quite a bit with milkweed and milkweed just wants to go, it just wants to be buoyant. And I've done pieces with milkweed in boxes and it's still buoyant in those boxes. And I, because that's the nature of the material. And I think it's so important to understand materials and it's fascinating to understand materials, what they can do and what they can't do. Um, yeah, so that's what I did there. And there's very funny stories about the whole thing. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you so much. You've been really patient and um, thank you for coming out.
it's really special. <laughs> Thank you.